So come to Act 5, Scene 3, we'll not read the other scenes of this play. We're not going to read the scenes that you find in the middle of this play because the middle of the play is not so significant as the beginning or the ending of the play. I think all of you remember what I said in the last class. I was telling you that Dr. Foster has a very impressive beginning and a very interesting ending, but the middle of the play is not so important. It's not so significant. It's not so impressive. In fact, it is not relevant. It is found that what is happening in the middle of the play is not relevant to what is happening in the beginning of the play. You have seen how impressively the play began in the first act, in the second act, we have seen Dr. Foster's, and Dr. Foster's was really a very impressive person, and he was doing something that was drawing our attention. All the audiences were busy and noticing what Dr. Foster's was doing, because Dr. Foster's was doing something that was uh, uh, that drew our attention, and we could not but pay attention to what Dr. Foster's was saying. The play began with a conflict in the mind of Dr. Foster's. Dr. Foster's, we see, we, we have seen in the beginning that Dr. Foster's is a highly educated person, is now trying to find out which a study he will follow. And we have seen how you are sitting with many books open before him, trying to decide which book he will read. And finally, we have seen that he was choosing the book of necromancy. He signed a bond with his own blood, bequeathing his soul to Lucifer, saying that after death, his soul will go to Lucifer. And he's doing all these things. He's taking the risk of being eternally damned only for 24 years service of uh, uh, Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles will serve him for 24 years, and only for this service of Mephistopheles for 24 years, Dr. Foster's is uh, making a will of his soul to Lucifer. And look, he's not making an oral promise, rather he is signing a bond with his own blood. So he's doing such a thing uh, in the beginning of the play. In the beginning of the play, we all audiences were thinking very deeply over what Dr. Foster's was doing. But what happens in the middle of the play is not very relevant to what was happening in the beginning of the play. You know that a story has to a story has to a story has three parts: the beginning, the middle, and the end. The beginning very smoothly leads to the middle of the play, and the middle again very smoothly leads to the ending of the play. Uh, a play becomes more significant, more interesting, usually in the middle of the play. In the beginning, uh, uh, a story is not so impressive, it's not so interesting, it's not so significant as it becomes in the middle of the play, middle of the, play, middle of the story. Uh, 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 a story begins with a problem in the beginning. The problem is not so acute in the beginning, but gradually the problem becomes very acute in the middle of the play. All audiences, all readers get involved in the play in the middle of the story. But here we see that nothing significant is happening in the middle of the play. What Dr. Foster is doing is not so significant. Whether he's doing something silly, something funny, that uh, are completely uh, disconnected from what he was doing in the middle of the play. If somebody enters the uh, auditorium 20 minutes late, I think he will not be able to understand what is happening here. That uh, audience will not be able to gaze that the drama began in an impressive way. The drama began with such a serious problem. The audience will not be able to gaze if the audience in charge the auditorium 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes late. I mean, it may happen that if an audience, if an audience in charge of the auditorium uh, uh, 20 minutes late, he might, he does not know the story of Dr. Foster's. He doesn't have any idea of the greatness of this story. Uh, so when he has in charge of the auditorium 10 minutes or 20 minutes late, when he sees that Dr. Foster's is doing something funny, irrelevant, um, is not so important, significant, the audience will not, must, will not have much interest in uh, watching what is happening on the stage in the middle of the play. He might leave the auditorium and come back. You see, it happens. 
even many of the audiences who entered the play entered the audience in the beginning may leave the auditorium yeah, they entered the auditorium uh, before the beginning of the play they have been watching the play for 20 minutes or 30 minutes after 30 minutes they notice that something happening something is happening on the stage that is not very relevant that is not very interesting that is not very significant so people may lose interest to see these insignificant things that are happening on the stage you know although we are going to watch a movie in a theater in a, in, in a, in a cinema or in a theater we have value of our time oh, we go there to have delight and with delight we learn significant things if a movie is not interesting if a story is not interesting we will perhaps not spend our time sitting in the cinema hall uh, watching that uh, uh, that film that is not interesting that is not instructive that is not drawing my attention that does not make any appeal to me will not do that it happens if you are going to a cinema hall to watch a movie uh, after few minutes you are coming out you will see many audiences are coming out they are uh, smoking outside they are gossiping with somebody they are talking to somebody over phone because they have thought that being outside and talking over phone to somebody is uh, much more important or pleasing than sitting inside the cinema watching that movie which is not actually important or significant it happens we do that we have gone to watch a cinema watch a movie yeah. and after 30 minutes we're coming out we are coming out why are we coming out because nothing significant is happening here in the movie and that's why we're coming out we are gossiping with somebody or we are taking tea in a tea stall yeah. we are talking to somebody over phone then after 20 minutes again we are entering into the theater why did we not uh, stay inside the hall watching the movie because nothing important was happening nothing important was happening. if everything that was happening in the story was interesting was impatient was appealing if it could draw our attention we would not have left the auditorium we would not have come out it happens it happens because the story is not interesting in the middle or in some uh, episodes almost a such a thing is happening in dr foster's in the middle you will see what dr foster's is doing you will see what dr foster's was doing in the beginning and see what dr foster's is doing in act three and in act four dr foster's is not doing anything significant that can draw our attention in fact you will see that many of the audiences are losing interest if there were 100 audiences in the beginning in the middle it might be that there are 50 audiences and 50 audiences have left thinking that the ending of the play would also be as irrelevant as the major end. but when we read the ending of the play we see that the ending of the play is as impressive as the beginning the ending and the beginning are very related to one another the ending and the beginning are very related to one another one another what is happening in the ending of the play is a logical consequences of what dr Foster did in the beginning so the uh, ending is very relevant very connected to the beginning of the play but things that are happening in the middle of the play are not not connected either to the beginning or to the ending because these things are it seems to us that these things are, uh, are, are are funny things having no connection with what dr fosters was doing in the beginning and what is now happening to dr fosters in the end or what dr fosters is doing in the end this is dramaturgic flow of this play many critics are saying that this is a kind of dramaturgic flow of the play because a play has to be a very all the scenes all the acts the whole story of uh, of a of a drama or of a novel has to be well lit yeah. and everything has to be well developed 
you have to keep focus on everything that you are incorporating in your story if you are a dramatist if you are a novelist if you are writing a story what you have to do is to give equal importance to everything that you are writing nothing you should do in the story nothing you should write in the story that will be irrelevant and that may destroy the significance of the of the story the story has an appeal the story has a kind of significance you are telling a story if something disrupts the flow of the story then that is that is that is an obstacle that should not be incorporated in the story good dramatists have not done that if you are reading a play of shakespeare we will read a uh, shakespeare's macbeth you have read shakespeare's the merchant of venice you have seen how all scenes are equally significant if you are just taking away one scene from the play you will see that the play is becoming very loose okay just if you are uh, bringing out one brick from a wall you will see that the wall is now looking very ugly imperfect okay there is a kind of imperfection in the wall if you are bringing out one brick from the wall in the same way if you are removing one scene then you will see that the play uh, is not as perfect as it was that means there is a gap in the story so all scenes that you would find in a shakespearean play in a play of shakespeare are very connected to one another the second scene is connected to the first scene the second scene is connected to the third scene the third scene is connected to the second scene the third scene is connected to the fourth scene in this way all acts and all scenes are connected to one another there is not a single scene or nothing is happening in the play that is causing a disturbance to the flow of the story the story is running very smoothly holding uh, the hand of another scene one scene is ending having something or leaving something that is being continued by the next scene the next scene is ending leaving something that is being continued by the ne next scene this is how all scenes are very closely connected to one another in in an empty play of shakespeare but what you see in dr foster's is contra contra contrary to uh, uh to to what we find in a good play dr christopher marlow was also a great dramatist even during um, shakespeare's time marlow's time during the elizabethan period christopher marlow was considered to be more important a dramatist than shakespeare shakespeare was not so famous during his lifetime people began to feel interested in shakespeare 200 years after the date of shakespeare shakespeare is today so famous a dramatist so popular a dramatist people across the world have acknowledged him to be the greatest dramatist of the world but shakespeare himself could not see the greatness that he has been conferred on 200 years after his death during his lifetime shakespeare was not so great was not so important so shakespeare could not see his fortune that he had got 200 years later after his death but marlowe christopher marlowe was a great dramatist believed by everybody at that time because he was a university boy in fact christopher marlowe ben johnson lily green flee who were called university boys did not think that shakespeare was at all a dramatist many of them were feeling envious of what shakespeare was doing or people were talking or saying about shakespeare so why is it happening marlowe was so great a dramatist but we see that the drama written by marlowe had a kind of dramaturgic flaw flaw <coughs> it has a kind of fault in the middle of the play the middle of the play is so weak so disconnected from the beginning or from the ending that it diminishes the importance of the play why is it happening did marlowe do it willingly was marlowe not a, a, a good dramatist did he know well the dramaturgy of the, that is the art of writing drama did he, dramaturgy means art of writing drama did he uh, have not enough knowledge of the of, of, of the art of drama 
why did he do that? It may be that he didn't notice that, okay, or he didn't think in the way we are thinking today. Perhaps at that time, uh, today we are saying that a drama has to have three parts, the beginning, the middle, and the end. But this realization we have got in the 20th century. Yeah. It is not that in the Elizabethan period or in the 70th, in the Elizabethan period, they had such theories that today we are following. Perhaps Christopher Marlowe thought that he was writing a very good drama. He didn't go to think in the way we are thinking today in 21st century. At that time, it was a good way that he was following to write the drama. There may be another explanation of why uh, Christopher Marlowe did not make the play so interesting in the middle of the play. Why Dr. Foster is doing funny things in the middle of the play? Uh, there, there can be, we can give an explanation. We can justify uh, the uh, comic scenes, the funny things that Dr. Foster is doing in the middle of the play. We can give a justification. Think Dr. Foster is not a character of drama. What you have to do, you, you, you are students of second year, what you have to do when you are evaluating a literary text is that you have to think that the characters in a literary text are very much like living people who live uh, around us. Yeah. A, a character of a drama or a character of a novel is very much like a person who is my neighbor or who is my relative or who is my accountant or he lives around me, who is my colleague. So characters in a literary piece are very much like living characters. Bring the character out of the text and think that the person is very much like you or very much like a man whom you know very well, very much like your friend, very much like your friend's father, very much like your relative or your neighbor or your colleague or somebody who lives very close to you. That means somebody who is your neighbor. This is how you have to consider a character of a literary text. And now we're going to see why that man is doing such a funny thing or why this man is doing such an important thing or why a man, why this character is doing this thing in that particular way. Don't go to think that he is a literary character, character of literature, character of a drama, character of a novel. No, don't go to think so. Rather, bring the character from the text. Okay, bring the character out from the text and consider him to be a person you know very well, who lives very close to you, who is very much like your neighbor. And now go to understand why that person is behaving in that way. Why that person is doing something or is not doing something so significantly as we expect. You have seen in the beginning to acts how Dr. Foster was feeling pulled and pushed by the two sides of his mind after signing the bond, after signing the bond with his blood, even before signing the bond, when Dr. Foster took the decision that he would practice necromancy, just a few hours after he took the decision that he would practice necromancy, we saw the one part of his mind was telling Dr. Foster, Dr. Foster, you should not do that. Leave the book of necromancy. That is a cursed book that will take you to hell. Another, uh, another part of his mind is telling Dr. Foster, that no Dr. Foster, do, uh, do read this book because this book will bring you a world of profit, a world of delight, a world of omnipotence. And you have seen how Dr. Foster is divided into two parts of his mind. Sometimes he's feeling very paralyzed. He cannot understand what he would do in this moment. After signing the bond with his blood, Dr. Foster's tension, anxiety increased. He looks up and feels, feels very shocked when he realizes that he has been deprived of the heavenly joys huh, for evil. He sometimes goes to cars mechanistically saying that you have deprived me of the blessings of God. It is you who is destroying my life. And you saw how desperately Dr. Foster was thinking of going back to God. Dr. Foster was, was, was going back to God, defying everything, leaving everything, leaving the book of magic, 
leaving Mephistopheles. And you have seen that Mephistopheles went to call in Belzebub and Lucifer. Lucifer came, Belzebub came and threatened Dr. Costas. The Dr. Costas, you have signed the deed with your own blood, uh, bequeathing your soul to Lucifer. That is the place that you have made that after your death, your soul would go to Lucifer. And now you have to think of only hell. Don't go to think of Christ or heaven. Thinking of Christ and heaven is contrary to our belief. You are now a spirit. You are now a devil. So what you have to do is not to think of God. It's not to think of heaven. It's not to think of Christ or Bible. You have to think of Lucifer. You have to think of Belzebub. You have to think of hell. This is what you have to do. Belzebub was terrific. Lucifer was frightening. And uh, when Dr. Foster saw Lucifer and Dr. Foster, Dr. Sorry, when Dr. Foster saw Lucifer and Belzebub, he apologized to them for the mistake that he committed by uttering the name of Jesus Christ or by looking up, by naming God. Dr. Foster said that he would never name God or Jesus Christ in his life. So this was the mental anxiety that Dr. Foster was in towards the beginning of the play. And now, if Dr. Luke, Dr. Foster would have to live 24 years, and if Dr. Foster goes through such a pain, such an anxiety and tension for 24 years, it is difficult for Dr. Foster to live. Because a man cannot live with tension that is mounting every minute. A man cannot live with anxiety that is increasing every minute. When you are in anxiety, you will see that if you are in anxiety and tension, you will see that your blood pressure will go up and you will fall down, you will die, you will suffer a stroke and you will die. So if Dr. Foster was going on being pulled and pushed eh, by the two sides of his mind, always he was in a, that kind of conflict, dilemma, eh, he was in that kind of anxiety and tension, Dr. Foster could not live 24 years. So if Dr. Foster now wants to live 24 years, Dr. Foster has to do something that would bring him completely out of that anxiety and tension that he was gripped with at the beginning of the play. You will see, you have to do that. You, you know, people go up to St. Martin, to Cox's Brother, to Thailand, or people are going out for sightseeing. Why do people go, do you know? Don't think that people are going there when they have enough free time. Many of the people are going to Fox's Brother, going to St. Martin, are going to Thailand or other beautiful places just to get relief of the pains, of the tension, of the anxiety that they are facing now. Sometimes people are terribly under, under pressure, under tension, anxiety, and just to get relief of this patient, of this change or anxiety, people do something. You know, you will sing a song only when you are in change. People sing songs, people sing songs, people hear songs just to dispel the anxiety, the tension from their mind. When you are gripped with pain, when you are feeling very sorry with striking, you are just playing your record and you are listening a song or you are humming a song. Why are you humming a song? Why are you listening, hearing a song just to remove the tension, the anxiety that have come over your mind that are paralyzing you? So to come out of this tension and anxiety, you are playing um, um, records, you are singing, <coughs> you are watching a movie. Then what, what kind of movie you are watching? You are not watching any sad movie, tragic movie. You are choosing a very comic movie where funny things are happening, like Three Stooges or Shari Chuatkin. You are watching such a movie because you need to laugh. And when you are watching a movie, a comic movie, or when you are hearing a song, or when you are humming a song, or when you are sitting outside, uh, uh, sitting in the balcony, looking outside, doing something, taking coffee, or drinking coffee, or talking to your friend, People from outside may think that you are in a happy mood. That is why you are having a song, you are hearing a song, or you are watching a funny movie, comic movie, or you are doing this, these things. 
people from outside may think but you are actually doing all these things just to come out of the pains just to come out of the changes anxiety that you are suffering from so i go to cox's bazaar not when i have free time rather when i'm dying under pressure i need I, i i need to relax i need to relax i need um, i need to free my head free my mind and just to free my head and mind i am going to cox's bazaar i'm going to saint martin i'm going to thailand or i'm going to another place uh, just to be away from this you know sometimes when we are under pressure and when we go to our village home or when we are going to such a place we can be away from these tensions for the time being if we are staying there for seven days for the seven days completely we are away from the problems that we had in dhaka city that we had in our daily life so sometimes we are doing these things <clears throat> i personally do that when i have problem i have anxiety i have tension i do something if you see and uh, then you will say that momin sir is in a very happy mood but i am not actually in a happy mood i'm doing all these things just to remove the tension pain anxiety that i have in my mind now so to relax to free my mind i'm watching a comedy i usually i i i used to watch movie when i was a student of college during my university life i also had the habit of watching movie but not so much but now i watch movie when do i watch movie when i'm thinking something but i cannot come to a conclusion and that is giving a serious pain to me i go to watch a movie i'm watching movie not to huh eh? not 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 to spend my time in uh, uh in happiness okay rather i'm watching this movie to have happiness just to forget the pains and the anxiety that i was suffering from it is done by people so you will see many people are doing that when the people are in tension they are reading books they are hearing songs they are watching movies they are um, going to different places for sightseeing this is they are going to a restaurant they are doing adda with friends so when somebody will see you doing adda with your friends one may feel that you are in a very jovial mood but actually not you you are not in a jovial mood you are in tension and anxiety just to come out of the tension and anxiety you are doing other with the tracks so there is a story beneath the story what you see on the surface is not always true what is happening on the surface is sometimes of the mark there is a secret story that we cannot see and that is why we go to uh, have a misinterpretation sometimes of things that you see happening on the surface there is you will always I believe one thing that what you see is not always true what you see is not always true as in martin de venice you had one sentence saw one sentence all that glitters is not gold said shakespeare in the same way we should also believe that what you see on the surface is not always true and what we see is not actually what we see always what we see is not always what we see you see somebody doing something but actually that man is not doing that thing with the purpose in his with that purpose in the mind he had a different purpose and that's why he is doing this it happens so dr fosters is doing funny things <clears throat> you will discover him in, in in funny scenes in comic scenes really what he is doing usually is done by babies naughty boys the parish owners of pg saying their prayer and dr fosters is going eh tickling them disturbing them snatching away their caps from the heads this is how funny things dr fosters is doing dr fosters should not do these things but dr fosters is doing this because if he just not do such funny comic things now it will be very difficult for dr fosters to live 24 years time one cannot live a long life with tension and anxiety in his mind dr fosters is in a serious anxiety is in a serious tension and with that serious tension and anxiety it is really really very difficult for dr fosters to live a long life you know if you are if you have if, if you had a stroke you will see many people i had a teacher who um, 
had an open heart surgery. That person always laughed, was always laughing. Yeah. Even unreasonably, he was laughing. For no reason, he was laughing. One day I asked him, so why do you always laugh? There has to be a significant reason behind your laughing, but you see always. It doesn't matter whether the reason is significant or not. But he said that laughing is my treatment now. I laugh, don't think that I'm laughing. Yeah, I have to laugh. My doctor has told me, has recommended me, that I should be in a cheerful mood as much as possible. So I do not take anything seriously. The person does not take anything seriously. So apparently, you might feel that the person is a very funny man, but actually the man is not a funny man, but he has to be in a funny mood only to be away from tension, anxiety. Because if you think about something very seriously, serious things have happened. As a colleague, we are expecting him to be serious, as serious we, as we became. Yeah, to think about the matter as seriously as we are doing. But you see that he's sitting nonchalant, as if nothing has happened. Sometimes I was getting angry with the person. And one day I asked him, so how can you sit in this way, nonchalant, without thinking anything of what has happened here? Yeah, a serious thing has happened. We are all in tension, but you are sitting as if nothing has happened. What is that? The, so looking at his attitude, examining his behavior, one might feel that the man is really very much irresponsible, does not have much common sense to understand when, what he should do, but he knows everything. But he deliberately behaves in that non way because that is his treatment. If he goes to think seriously, as seriously as I am thinking, you are thinking, that man is not going to live a long life. So the only way, you are in um, Jagannath University, I have seen, I was in Purandaka once, and every day I used to come to Victoria Park uh, to work um, at night. And I saw some people are standing, they are laughing, but they are laughing. That is their exercise. 15, 20 people are laughing together. <laughs> they are laughing. In the beginning, I was thinking, are these people mad people? They are laughing in a chorus. They are not singing. They are laughing in a chorus. I gradually understood that that is their exercise. They are doing that. Okay? Somebody has told them, or perhaps they are um, doing something uh, or, or has or has heard from somebody that laughing is a way of living a cheerful life, and that's why they're practicing. So if people from outside see them that they are laughing, eh, people may think that they are doing something very funny, very insignificant, but this is very significant to them. This laughing in a chorus for no reason at all is a very significant task to them. Very routinely, every day they come and they laugh in the chorus. Fifty persons are standing or sitting together and they're laughing in a chorus. You might feel that these people are mad, doing something funny, irrelevant, but it is a significant task to them. I have taught this semester a play, The Cherry Watson, written by Anton Chekhov. There is a character there, Mrs. Vanepskia. Okay. Our cherry orchard is being auctioned. She is in terrible tension. She has tried desperately to save the orchard from being auctioned because the cherry orchard is her ancestral property. She inherited this property from her father. Her father inherited that orchard from his father. His father inherited that cherry orchard from his father. This is how for generations the members of this family have inherited this cherry orchard. And now Mrs. Tanevskia, who is the owner of this cherry orchard, is going to lose it because she borrowed money from bank mortgaging the cherry orchard, but she now does not have as money as, he, as she needs to pay back the loan. Finally, her cherry orchard is being auctioned. The lady is crying desperately, trying desperately to save the orchard from being auctioned. When the cherry orchard is being auctioned, on the day of the cherry orchard, you see that Mrs. Ranetskia has thrown a party at her home. She has invited many people. Many people have come and Mrs. Ranetskia is dancing there. Why is she dancing? 
Is it a day when she should dance? She is crying to. She is crying that her cherry orchard would be auctioned if she cannot pay back the loan. She is crying desperately to manage money to pay back the loan. Otherwise, her cherry orchard would be auctioned. And on the very day when her cherry orchard was being auctioned, she has thrown a party and she is dancing in the party. Is it a day when she should dance? No, it is not a day when she should dance. But she is dancing because if she does not dance, she will die. If she does not die, then the, the tension of what is going in the auction will kill her. The anxiety of what is happening in the auction will kill her. So just to forget that anxiety, just to be away from the tension, she is dancing. But if somebody sees that she is dancing, one might feel that, oh, that lady is dancing, so she does not have any tension, she does not have anxiety, she does not want to save her orchard from the auction. But actually, she is not dancing. This is not actually dancing. She is dancing only to forget the pains. Sometimes we do many fun things to forget pains, to forget anxiety and tension. These funny things are the sources of our life sometimes. So Dr. Foster is doing funny things in the middle of the play only because if he just not do these funny things, then he will die. If the middle of the play was as serious as the beginning was, Dr. Foster could not could not live 24 years, could not live his raise his destination. We would have seen that before the 24 year time is over, Dr. Foster had a heart stroke and died. We had to see that. So Dr. Foster, if you consider him to be a man living very close to your person, if you think Dr. Foster to be a man living uh, in a flat opposite yours, then you will see, you will try, if you think Dr. Foster is very much like your father, very much like your brother, or very much like your neighbor, you will see Dr. Foster is doing a very relevant thing. What Dr. Foster is saying on the surface is irrelevant, but to Dr. Foster, what is happening or what Dr. Foster is doing is really, really very significant. That is how the medial of the play can be justified because Dr. Foster is a man. You can never see a man with, living with tension for huh? a long life. Never it can be possible. You will never see. We have never seen. No man can be living with tension. A man will be paralyzed. A man will have a stroke. If the man is thinking so seriously all the time. So what Dr. Foster is doing, I think meaningful. Although many this is a serious allegation against Dr. Foster, against the play Dr. Foster, that the play has a very good beginning and a very good ending, but the middle of the play is not very enchanting, it's not very relevant. But I consider the middle of the play is very relevant. It's very significant. The middle of this play should have been like this. If we have any sympathy and love for Dr. Foster, if we want Dr. Foster to live 24 years, if Dr. Foster was going through such tension and anxiety as he was going through in the beginning, then Dr. Foster would have been an unreal character. Dr. Foster would have been an unreal character. And we don't want to see unreal things. We don't want to see unreal things because un we feel interested only in those people, in those things that we find real, relevant to our life, situ our life, real life situations. Dr. Foster would have been an incredible and unreal person if he had been living in the way he was living in the beginning. Just you will think at night whether what um, Christopher Marlowe has done to Dr. Foster was right or wrong. You will feel that Dr. Fo Christopher Marlowe had, had done the right thing to Dr. Foster by presenting him in that way in the middle of the play. Otherwise, Dr. Foster could not live 24 years. But Dr. Foster could not have the realization that he had at the end of the play. Now come to the last 
scene of this play. This is act five, scene three. Can you hear me? Can you please tell me whether you can hear me? Clearly. Can anyone copy? Absent a copy, I see you here. Can you tell me whether you can hear me? Yes, sir. Um, um, can you hear me clearly? Is there anybody yes, who has sir. a problem? I, I think all of you hear clearly. I'm trying to speak loudly so that you can hear me. So come to Act 5, Scene 3, line number 165. Okay. Look, Dr. Fosters. Dr. Fosters is now talking to himself. He's alone. And you know, soliloquy, I told you what a soliloquy is. When a character speaks to himself, and when a character speaks to himself, we have an opportunity of looking into the heart of the character, looking into the mind of the character. We can see what the character is thinking actually. If you, you see somebody, but you cannot understand what the man has in his mind, but the, when the man is revealing his mind, you can see. How can you reveal your mind? There is no way of revealing your mind. There is no machine that can help us to look into the mind of a person and see what is there in the mind of the person. The writers of this period, Christopher Marlowe, Shakespeare, especially Shakespeare. Shakespeare was a great artist of creating important soliloquies. His soliloquies are psychoanalytical therapies that have helped us to directly enter into the hearts of the characters and see with our own eyes what the man is thinking in his mind. And Mominuddin is thinking one thing in his mind and telling you another thing. There is a good difference between the face and the mind. You can only see the face, but you cannot see my heart. Uh, Soliloquy helps readers, audiences, enter into the heart of the character and the audiences can see with their own eyes what things are there in the mind of the character. Look, Dr. Fosters is now talking to himself. Ah, oh, Fosters, now hath thou but one hour, one bear hour to live. Dr. Foster signed the board bond uh, with his blood to have 24 years service from Memphis to please, 24 years. And about to go, only one hour is left. Okay, 23 hours, 300, 40, 364 days, and 23 hours are gone. Now only one hour is left. Dr. Foster understands that after one hour, he will die, and after his death, his soul will go to hell. His soul will go to Lucifer according to the bond that he signed with his blood. So Dr. Foster is now thinking, is standing on the age of day. Ah, oh, Foster, thou had but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. And then you must be damned perpetually, Dr. Foster. Stand still, you, you are morning spheres of heaven that time may cease and midnight never come. Labib, can you turn on the light, Baba? So look, Dr. Fosters is now crying, request, request, requesting Dr. Fosters is to, <coughs> yes, turn on the light, Baba. Dr. Fosters is now crying, requesting the sun not to move. The morning spheres of heaven that time may cease. Oh, sun, don't move. Time, oh, time, please stop, don't flow. Midnight never come. Oh, midnight don't come. If the sun does not set, sets, the night will never come. So Dr. Fosters is requesting the sun not to move. Please stop there where you are. Because if you move, then the last hour will be over and Fosters will have to die. Oh, sun, don't move. Time, don't. O oh, time don't flow, midnight don't come, fair nature's eye rise, rise again, and make perpetual day, and let this hour be but a year, a month, a week, or a national day. O oh, sun, sun, rise, rise again, 
and make a perpetual day. Make a perpetual day. A day will be a perpetual day. This day will never come to an end. Make this day perpetual or make this hour. Let this hour be but a year. Or at least let this hour be turned into one year. This one hour will be as long as a year is. Or at least turn this hour into one month. Or if you are not making the turning the hour into a month, at least turn it into a week. Or one natural day that Pastor may repent and save his soul so that Pastor can have enough time to repent and save his soul. Dr. Pastor does not have much time in his hand to repent. He has only one hour to repent. In one hour, I cannot repent. That is not enough time. So, oh God, turn this one hour into one hour into one year or at least one month. Or if you don't turn it into one month, turn it at least one week or one perpetual day or one natural day so that Dr. Pastors can have enough time to repent and save his soul. The stars move still, time runs, the clock will strike. Oh my God, eh? the stars are moving still. Time runs, time runs and the clock will strike. The clock will strike soon. The devil will come now. If the clock will strike, when the clock will strike 12, the devil will come. The devil will come. First us must be chant. First us must be chant. Oh, I live up to God. Before the devil comes, I will live up to God. The devil will not be able to cast me, keep me, or live up to God. Or oh, who pulls me down? Oh my God, I see somebody pulling me down. See, see, where Christ's blood stream in the firmament, one drop would save my soul. Oh, I can see Christ's blood flowing in the sky. Only one drop of that blood can save my soul. Not one drop I need. I need only half a drop. If I get only half a drop of the blood of Jesus Christ that I see up, that drop can save my soul. Ah, my Christ arranged not my heart of naming of my Christ, or who is rending my heart for naming my Christ. Dr. Foster is now saying, my Christ, I'm naming my Christ and somebody is rending my heart. Yet will I call on him. Although you are rending my heart, perhaps Mephisto please, or Lucifer or Belzebub, huh? or they are together rending the heart of Dr. Foster's because Dr. Foster's is naming Christ. Dr. Foster's is saying, although you rain my heart, I will call on him. I will call on Jesus Christ. Oh, spare me, Lucifer. Lucifer, spare me. Where is it now? It's gone. See where God is straight out his arm. Oh, I can see God is stretching his hand towards me. God is still merciful towards me. God will still help me, will save me. I see God is stretching out his arm and bends his airful bows. Mountains, hills, come, come and fall me. Oh, mountains and hills, come, come and fall on me and hide me from the heavy wrath of God. Mountain, mountain, hills, come, come and fall on me and hide me. So that, look, now he's saying, perhaps God will punish me because I signed the board and bequeathed my soul to Lucifer. So God will punish me. So hide me from the wrath of God. Oh, no, no. Then I will, will I headlong run into the act? Now Dr. Foster is saying, no. Uh, if the mountain does not come to fall on me, if the hill does not come to fall on me, I will hide I will run headlong into the earth. That means I will run headlong means I will run with my head down into the earth so that earth gave, oh earth gave, that means make a hole so that I can run headlong into the into the hole or it will not harbor me. Then I will run headlong into the earth so that Lucifer, Belgebub, Mephistopheles do not find me. I will hide into the earth. Oh, it will not harbor me. Oh my God, 
Even the art will not give me shelter. Nobody will give me shelter. Fosters is so rotten a soul. Fosters is such a sinner that neither the mountains, nor the hills, nor the clouds, nor the earth, nothing will help him. He will start the train at my nativity, whose influence hath alluded death and hell. Now draw up for stars like a foggy mist. Oh, we stars who were shining at the top time of my birth, who are responsible for the good person and bad person of a person. I request you now to lift me up and make me get merged with you so that nobody can find me. Dr. Foster is now requesting them the stars. Today we don't have this kind of belief, but people in the past had this kind of belief. They, when you were born, there was a star that was shining. And the movement of the star is responsible for the sufferings, for the good person, bad person of you. Okay, this is how people in the even only 50 years back in our country, people had belief in stars. The, it was a belief that a star was shining at the type of my birth, and that star, the movement of that star, is responsible for everything that happens to my life. This is a, if you are watching Kona, if you have watched Kona. Of Indian serial, you will find that. Or if you are reading or watching any movie that were made just 60, 70 years back, you may find it. People had this kind of, even Western people, people of Germany, people of England also had that kind of belief that one star was shining at the time of your birth and the movement of that star is responsible for everything that happens to your life. Dr. Fosters is requesting the stars that were shining at the time of his birth, that oh stars, please lift me up and make, help me to get marched with you so that nobody can find me. You heard about clouds, oh cloud, help me to get hidden in you, that when you vomit forth into the air, my limbs may issue from your smoky mouths. Oh clouds, please help me to get hidden into you. And when you will vomit, man, when it will rain, I want to drop down with you, with, with the drops of rain. Nobody will find me, so that my soul may but ascend to heaven. So this is how Dr. Fosters is crying. Dr. Fosters is crying. Dr. Fosters is crying because Dr. Fosters knows that he is a sinner. A pious man does not cry at the time of death. A sinner cries at the time of death. A pious man does not have any fear. A pious man does not have any fear of being punished by God in by God in hell. Okay. Because he did not do any crime or any sin in his lifetime that he would have to be punished in the hell. So pious man is not so sad, is not so tasked as, uh, as as Dr. Foster's is, okay, is not lamenting or crying in the way Dr. Foster's is doing. The man who is a sinner, who has always cheated people, who has always done bad things in his life, is now dying with a mountain of sins over his head. He does not have anything that would save him from the wrath of God in heaven, hell. That's why he is crying. That's why he cries. So a pious man does not cry. A sinner cries at that time of death because he has fear that he would have to get return of everything that he did during his lifetime. And that's why he is crying. Dr. Foster is crying because he knows that he is eternally damned. All his life he would have to be in the hell. That's why he is crying. It is true. So don't do bad things in your life. You are very much like a guest on this earth. How many years will you live here? Only foolish people do bad things on this earth. Foolish people. I will say that these people are more foolish than the fools. They don't have any common sense. Who are voting money, eh, cheating people. There are many people who are cheating even their own brothers, even their sisters, even their own parents. There are many people who are sending out their parents from the home. Eh? They are getting all property of the parents and now they are sending the parents out. You will never find the great fool anywhere in the world because 
how many days he would be here? You have to die one day. And you will die with what? What will you carry to your grave? If they are, if you are doing this, you will live here only 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, or 100 years. After 100 years, you have to leave this world. So leaving everything behind, you have to go empty handed. Why are you greedy to do all these things? When Alexander died, you know, you may have heard the name of Alexander. Okay. You may have the name of this great uh, Orion. Who he wanted to be the king of the whole of the world. He even invaded India. Alexander died and when he was dying, he told his ministers that after my death, you will scatter. That when my dead body will be carried to the uh, graveyard, huh? you will keep my hands, it, you will keep my two hands hanging outside the coffin. My two hands will be hanging outside the coffin. And this is how you will carry me to the graveyard. This is one wish. Another wish is that my coffin will be carried to the graveyard by my doctors. He had many personal doctors. So he said that all my doctors will carry my coffin to the graveyard. No relatives will carry my coffin to the graveyard. And another wish was that all his jewels, eh, gold pieces, that he acquired during his lifetime will be scattered on the way when his dead body will be carried to the graveyard. That means there will be some people who will be scattering all diamond pieces, gold pieces, everything that he had on the way when his dead body will be carried to the graveyard. One minister asked Alexander the Great, Oh king, why are you making such absurd wishes? As you are saying that these are your eh, last wishes. So we have to do what you are wishing because this is what we have learned from our culture that if a man wishes something before his death, we have to carry out the wishes, fulfill the wishes. So why are you making such absurd wishes? Alexander said that these are very significant. My dead bodies will be carried to the graveyard by my doctors because I want to tell the people of the world that doctors cannot save the life of a person. A man is mortal. A man would have to die. A man cannot be immortal. So it doesn't matter how many doctors you have, how much money you have, doctors will not be able to save your life. They can help you to live with comfort. Yeah. Even that is not um, always possible if God does not wish. So that is the lesson that I want to give to the people of the world. The doctors cannot save the life of a person. And that's why I have died. These doctors I maintained, but they have failed to keep me alive. I have died and my doctors are carrying my dead body to the grave. This is one thing. And my hands will be hanging outside of the cabin, of the, of the, of the, of the coffin. Cabin means coffin. Okay. I want to tell the people of the world that I came empty-handed and I'm going empty-handed. But I killed many kings, I killed many people to have so many kings. I conquered so many countries. I wanted to become the king of this world. I wanted to become a great person, but with what I'm dying, what, with what I'm living, I'm living empty-handed. So all these things that I did are completely meaningless. To be the king of the world, I did so many things. Alexander was so greedy to become the king of the world that even he invaded India. Some parts of India were conquered by him. When Bangladesh was conquered. In many parts of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan were conquered by Alexander. It is in India, Alexander was defeated. Okay. It is in India where Alexander was defeated. He could not finally conquer the India, whole of India, and he had to go back. And I am asking you to spread all my jewels, diamond peaches, gold peaches that I had in my life. I want to give a message to the people of the world that all these things 
and completely material. Only for these things, you are killing people, you are cheating people, you are taking bribes, you are cheating with your mother, with your father, with your brothers, with your relatives. Only for these things, money, money. But Alexander said that these things are not going with me. But only for these things, I conquered so many countries. I killed so many kings. I killed so many people. But all these things are nothing to me. I'm leaving behind. They are not going with me. So what will you do with these things? That will not go with you. That will give you a place in hell. Huh? For a perpetual place in hell. From where you will have no remedy. You are living here with a car, with a flat, or with these material comforts. And to have these material comforts, you have committed so many crimes. I have a colleague who said that his father, his father needed money. But he could not manage money from anywhere. So decided that he would retire early because he needed the money. He was a man with sense of prestige. He, he didn't go to borrow money from anybody because borrowing money was very disgraceful to him. He tried to have money from the, uh, from the sources where he could uh, keep his honor. But when he failed, finally he decided to return early. He submitted the resignation later. Finally, he had an opportunity of having the money, okay? He, he, he had a source to have the money. And now he went to that officer to withdraw the resignation letter because only in the morning he submitted. And this letter would be sent to ministry through a long process. Perhaps this letter would be in his office for one month. But that officer said that you have to give me 5,000 taka bribe. And this man said that I'm a teacher. I have always talked of honesty. Taking bribe is a sin. Giving bribe is also a sin. I'm not giving bribe. And that officer did not return the resignation letter. So that man had to return only. Only for 5,000 taka, that man did that injustice on this old man. This man is cursing that man all his life. Would that person be happy? Would, what, would he, what would he say to God when he would die? So this is how we are mourning money. This money would not go with us. These things for which we are doing so many, so many, so many. You, you have seen during this corona pandemic in Bangladesh, you have seen that Shahid, you have seen that Shahid who has earn money in an unscrupulous way by cheating with people when we all are praying to God to save us from coronavirus that man has got a good chance to make money oh my God what will you do with this money he's a fat man already God knows what will happen to him when he will die you have seen one doctor a highly educated person having a medical certificate, being a medical graduate from Dhaka Medical College, can she do that? How, what will it do? do? You know how much money a doctor earns? A doctor every day earns how much money? You can't imagine. Go to Ibn Sina, Lavage, eh? Square, go. How much money a doctor earns? 100 patients are waiting there. From every patient, they are taking 1,000 taka. Every day, they are earning lakhs of money. Nevertheless, their greed does not have any limit. They are cheating people, exploiting people in that way. What will you do with this money? Will that money will go with you? These people cry at the time of death because they know they are sinners. These people know that they are sinners. But a man who has always helped others, a man who laid a pious life, a man who was really a human being, sacrificing his comfort, his, 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 his many, many of his uh, delights for the happiness of the people of this society, that man will not laugh, cry 
that that man would be gladly waiting to have rewards from God. Death is helping him to go close to God to have rewards from Him directly. Death is not an end to your life. It is just it is just an exit from one life to another life. Remember, it is just an exit from one phase of your life to another phase. And this phase was a very little phase. And the biggest phase of your life is waiting, where you are going after death. So death is not actually, death is not actually a, 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 a full stop to your life, to your existence. It is just an exit. It is just transferring you. It is just a way of transferring you from this world to another perpetual world where you have to live all your life. So how you will live there is depending on what you did there. How you will live there is depending on what you did there. So now decide how you will live there. If you are living poor here, you will live rich there. And if you are living rich here, you will live poor there. People who are pious people, people who are honest people, I, 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 I'm not. I, I, I'm not saying that you have to be pious. At least you have to be good people, honest people. It is not that you have to be religiously pious people. Okay, you have to say prayer. You have to go to mosque, temples. You have to do all these things. There are many people who are not pious, who don't say prayer, but they are good people. They are innocent people. They have all their life worked for the betterment of society. It is their contribution that has made our society so beautiful. You'll find many people, you'll find many people in our society. Really, they don't go to church, they don't go to mosque, they don't go to temple, they don't say prayer. But they have respect to God. But for some reason they are not going. But they are good people. They stand by people when people are in distress. They help people when people need help. They work for the betterment of society. They work for the community. They think that is their duty. God has created them not to be selfish, but to be selfless. And that is how they are living. These people don't have any fear. They would die because they would die with a smile in their lips because they have the belief that after their death, they would be rewarded by God. Dr. Foster is crying because he is a sinner and he knows the sin that he has committed. Dr. No Foster knows what will happen to him because he knows everything. He was a student of theology. However, so the clock strikes ha the half hour. Finally, half hour is gone, only half an hour is left. A half hour is passed. It will be an on past and on. Soon the half hour will be over. Oh God, if thou will not have mercy on my soul, yet for Christ's sake, whose blood hath ransomed me, impose some end to my incessant pain. Oh God, if you don't show mercy to me, God, I know that you will not show mercy to me because I have done something for which you cannot show mercy to me. I am a sinner and I am a sinner, I am such a sinner that God, you cannot show mercy to me. Nevertheless, I play, I request, I request you, I pray to you to look for God's Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, whose blood hath ransomed me, impose some end to my incessant pain, fix the limit to my pain in hell. Tell me that I would have to be in hell for thousands of years, 20,000 years, then my soul will be purged of sins and I will be eligible to go to heaven. Or tell me that I would have to be in hell for 50,000 years, then I will be eligible to go to heaven. Fix a limit to my pain. I will be in hell for 50,000 years. One lakh year. Okay. But Dr. Fosters has has Dr. Foster has done something for which is, is eternal legend. Never, never Dr. Foster will be allowed to go to heaven. You know, every man will go to heaven. Every man will go to heaven. 
you will go to hell and you will be burned in the fire in hell and this fire is a source of purification you are being burned in the hell not because you are being punished actually your soul will be purified okay this fire this burning is a source of purifying your soul when your soul will be purified of all the sins that you had then your soul will go to heaven a, an impure soul cannot go to heaven a pure soul will get merged with the entity of the god so until you are becoming purified as until your soul is becoming purged of sins as long as you have signs of sins in your heart your soul your soul is not eligible to go to heaven so you would be burned in fire in the hell just to to get your soul purified and when your whole soul will be purified you will go to heaven and our religion says christianity says other religions also say that today or tomorrow one day your soul which is now in heaven hell will go to heaven but pastor's soul will never go to heaven because he is eternally damned that's why pastor is saying that oh god please fix some limit to my to my pain a hundred thousand and at last be saved i'm 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 ready to be in the hell for thousands of years but promise that finally i would be saved or oh, no end is limited to damn souls i know no end is eh, limited to damn souls this is how dr foster is crying then come to cursed be look uh, line number 113 okay cursed be the parents that engendered me dr foster is now going to curse his parents saying that you my parents you begot me i curse thee why did you curse why did you begot why did you begot dr foster why did you give birth to dr foster dr foster is now putting his father his mother for begotting him no foster curse myself curse lucifer dr foster to and dr foster has the realization that he is making a mistake by cursing his parents dr foster is saying that oh foster don't curse your parents curse yourself curse lucifer that had deprived me of the joys of heaven curse yourself dr foster curse that lucifer that lucifer had deprived you of the joys of heaven the clock strikes 12 and finally the clock strikes 12 it is 12 o'clock at night the hour 25 year time is over and now dr foster's soul will be snatched away from his body by lucifer benjibab and mephisto place all soul be changed into little dr foster's is saying oh it strikes it strikes now body turn into turn to year oh lucifer will bear the quick to hell oh soul soul be changed into little drop into year oh my oh soul be turned into year so that lucifer does not find you otherwise lucifer will bring you to hell dr foster is again crying this is the last cry dr foster makes oh soul be changed into little drop water drops and fall into the ocean never be found oh my soul be changed into little drops of water and get merged with the water of the ocean so that lucifer mephisto please belzebub do not find me dr foster now wants to be changed into drops of water and he wants to get merged with the water of the ocean he thinks that if he gets merged with the water of the ocean belzebub lucifer mephisto please will not be able to find him my god my god aninta devils just at the time when the time is up lucifer belzebub mephisto please they come they come to take away the soul of dr foster very big fingers frightening figures they are coming lucifer is looking looking terrifying belzebub is look, is looking frightening mephisto please is look, looking frightening they have come and look first oh my god my god look not so fierce 
on me. Don't look so fierce on me. Adar serpents, let me breathe a while, O oh, Adar serpents. Dr. Faustus is now calling Lucifer, Belzebub, and Mephistopheles, Adar serpents, let me breathe a while. Give me a little time to breathe. Ugly hell, gape not. Come not, Lucifer. O oh, ugly hell, don't open your mouth. Oh, Lucifer, don't come to me. I'll burn my books, oh, Mephistopheles. I'll burn my books. Oh, Mephisto, please. But Mephisto, please, Belgivab and Lucifer snatch away the soul of, take away the soul of Dr. Faustus from his body and flies to hell. This is how the story ends. You will find the chorus. The chorus is telling us eh, what we should do. So you will, so this happens. This is what happened to Dr. Faustus. Dr. Faustus meets this sad fate at the end. So why did Christopher Marlowe write this play? Did Christopher Marlowe write this play to tell the people of, uh, of, the, of the Renaissance period that if they follow the spirit of the Renaissance, then they would have to meet the fate as Dr. Foster's has fate. I'll give you another class on Dr. Foster's, okay? There is the last class. I'll not use uh, the textbook then. Uh, a sum up class, I'll give you. Uh, uh, discussing every important aspect that we have done. Uh, in the next class, I'll give you the class. And we'll try to understand uh, Christopher Marlowe's attitude. Uh, you know, a play is a kind of a, a, a vehicle through which hmm, the uh, author communicates his view to the readers. Hmm. Why does a man write a novel or a drama or a story? Does a man write a story, a novel or a drama only to give us or tell us this story? No. The man has a, the writer has a kind of message. The writer has a kind of message that he wants to communicate to the readers. He wants to tell people something. And that is why he writes. Sigmund Freud, you may have heard the name of Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud says that every writing uh, is an externalization of the inner thoughts of the author. The author has something in his mind that he wants to tell, but he cannot tell directly, he tells it indirectly through writing. So a writing is the expression of the heart and mind of the belief of the ideology of the philosophy of the author. The author has something to tell us. He believes something. He wants to tell us something. And through his writings, he communicates his views, his ideas, his beliefs, his philosophy yeah, to the readers. So what did Christopher Marlowe want to tell us through this play. What are we learning from Dr. Foster's? Was Dr. Foster's wrong? Did Dr. Foster's make a mistake by choosing the book of necromancy or by deciding to become a magician? We will discuss that in the next class. So I thank all of you for listening to me. I will request all of you, again I see some of the students have left me, I don't know whether they cannot hear me, can hear me or not, even I see one is joining now, okay, it's very painful. Um, I want to tell you one thing, my sons and daughters,